guys, attorney Mark Victor here with the Attorneys for Freedom Law Firm. Uh, I'm the founder of the firm, and uh, I wanna tell you that Attorneys for Freedom is a pro-freedom activist law firm. Uh, no lawyer gets to work at the Attorneys for Freedom Law Firm unless that lawyer can sign the Live and Let Live Pledge. What's the Live and Let Live Pledge? Check out Live and Let Live Org. This is the global peace movement that was actually founded by the Attorneys for Freedom Law Firm. That's right, we're activist attorneys, we're an activist law firm, we take a position, we're very pro-freedom. This video here is going to be about the exclusionary rule. I've been a criminal defense lawyer for almost 30 years. We do cases nationally, state courts, federal courts, appellate cases. Uh, we are licensed in both Arizona and in Hawaii. However, if you're in another state, you have a case and you want us to represent you, there is a rule called the Pro Hoc Vice rule that allows us to represent people in other states as we have on many occasions. So let me talk about the exclusionary rule. You probably heard about the exclusionary rule. Maybe you've wondered what the heck is this thing. Let me tell you what the exclusionary rule is, sort of a 30,000 foot view of what it is and how it works. First of all, there's nothing in our United States Constitution that says we need to have an exclusionary rule. The Constitution says things like, for example, in the Fourth Amendment, you are protected against unreasonable searches and seizures. The Constitution doesn't say what is an unreasonable search or seizure. So we have to rely on what the Supreme Court has said in the many, many decades of interpreting the Fourth Amendment to sort of lay down rules to say, this is a reasonable search or seizure, this is an unreasonable search or seizure. The Constitution also doesn't say what happens if the law enforcement officer commits an unreasonable search or seizure. What happens if they seize evidence in violation of the Fourth Amendment? Or said another way, they do something that's unreasonable and they seize evidence. Well, the Constitution is silent on this. So what's occurred is the federal courts specifically the United States Supreme Court in the early 1900s came up with a rule called the exclusionary rule that basically said, look, in order to deter uh, law enforcement officers from engaging in unreasonable searches and seizures, we're just gonna make a rule that basically says, whatever the fruit is of that search or seizure, in other words, the evidence that they seize, you can't use that at trial if they've uh, obtained that in violation of the fourth. You should also know the exclusionary rule has been expanded. It applies to the Fifth Amendment and the Sixth Amendment. So Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, or Sixth Amendment violations, if evidence has been secured unreasonably or in violation of one of those amendments, there's an argument that will be made by a criminal defense attorney in a criminal case to suppress, that's the language we use, to suppress that evidence so it can't be used at trial. Okay, first thing to note is I've said at trial, right? So the exclusionary rule, it doesn't apply to other important hearings that are not trials. So for example, if your case is being presented to a grand jury for the purpose of determining is there probable cause such that the grand jury returns what we call an indictment. Indictment is the fancy word we use for the official charging document when a grand jury, which by the way is a secret proceeding, you don't get to go to this, you don't get to know about it. Really the only people there are the members of the grand jury and the police officer oftentimes is the witness and a prosecutor and a court reporter. That's right, no you, no defendant, no defense attorney and no judge. So the prosecutor is charged with presenting the case in a fair manner, which sometimes happens and sometimes doesn't. But evidence that is obtained in violation of the Fourth, Fifth, or Sixth Amendment is admissible in front of the grand jury. That's right, it's not excluded by the exclusionary rule at a grand jury. It's also not excluded in a probation violation matter. So if you violated probation and there's evidence that was gathered unreasonably or illegally, or I should say unconstitutionally, they get to use that still 
in your probation violation or supervised release violation, no problem. It only applies at trial. I should also say it's not excluded in a civil case either. We're talking about a criminal case at trial. That's the remedy. They don't get to use it at trial. The idea here is that this is a disincentive. This will get law enforcement to uh, not violate the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment because why would they violate it if they don't get to use the fruit of that search at the trial. As I pointed out, this started out in the early 1900s as a federal rule. The states could still do whatever they want, but then later on, very famous case, Mapp versus Ohio, the Supreme Court decided, hey, we are gonna force this rule on all the states. So now the states are all required to use the exclusionary rule when evidence is unconstitutionally obtained. Now I want to tell you there are many exceptions. Like all the other rules we have in the law, there's always exceptions. And there is exception to the exclusionary rule. First of all, there's something called the private search doctrine. What does this mean? Well, it's possible that a private citizen, think private security or somebody else, nosy neighbor, something like that, if that person violates your Fourth Amendment rights and unreasonably searches or seizes something, the exclusionary rule does not apply. Now, there are arguments that can be made here if the private person is acting at the request of law enforcement, then they'll be considered still law enforcement. But what we're really talking about is a government agent, someone from the state or federal government. They're the ones who have to have violated the Fourth, Fifth, or Sixth Amendment in order for us to talk exclusionary rules. So oftentimes, on the other side of this argument, a prosecutor will argue this evidence was seized by a private person, and so the exclusionary rule doesn't apply. That'll be the argument. There's also a concept called standing. What that means is it's gotta be your rights that are violated. So if there are two people and uh, one person has, let's just say a bag search, they're stopped and they're detained and uh, the bag is searched in violation of the Fourth Amendment or said another way, the officer did something that has been determined to be unreasonable and seized evidence. And now that evidence can be used against you you don't get to complain about that because it wasn't your right that was violated. You can't use the exclusionary rule because somebody else's rights were violated. It has to be your rights. That's what we lawyers call the standing rule. You have to have standing. It has to be your right that was violated before you can complain about the exclusionary rule. Also, I did say that the exclusionary rule applies to trials, but there's even some little exceptions in there. It's possible that evidence that was obtained unreasonably that would normally be suppressed could come into a trial, say on cross-examination, if it's used to attack the credibility of the person who's testifying. So it could sneak into a trial even though it was unconstitutionally obtained. Then there's another rule that almost swallows up this rule, at least it applies in many, many circumstances. So imagine that a police officer unreasonably seizes evidence. They seize evidence, say, in violation of the Fourth Amendment, and uh, that evidence would be normally argued to be excluded under the exclusionary rule. Uh, the other side, the prosecutor can argue, well, it's true that this violated uh, the Fourth Amendment. However, uh, we were gonna get this evidence some other way anyway. It's called inevitable discovery. How does this come up? It comes up all the time when, say, an automobile is towed, right? Imagine you were uh, pulled over on the side of the road and uh, the officer said, hey, would you mind if I uh, search the car or something like that? And you said, no. The officer doesn't otherwise have some reason to search the car, and they search anyways. Imagine an unreasonable search, and they find something in there. But on the other hand, they smelled alcohol on your breath, and they determined that you agreed, which you shouldn't do, to take the failed sobriety test on the side of the road, and they determined, you know what, you're guilty of a DUI, and we're going to arrest you. And as a result of that, we're going to tow the car. And when we tow a car, we get to do what's called an inventory search. This is for your protection, to make sure that nothing valuable is missing when you get the car back. The prosecutor will argue, okay, even though this evidence was initially obtained unreasonably in violation of the Fourth Amendment, because we towed the car and did an inventory search, we were gonna discover this anyway. That's under the inevitable discovery exception to the exclusionary rule, and this comes up a lot. This saves uh, from the suppression of evidence 
uh, is oftentimes very damaging evidence against a defendant in a criminal case. This saves the evidence for the state from suppression lots and lots of times. So the inevitable discovery rule, you have to watch out for that. Prosecutor will often argue, hey, we were gonna discover this in any event. Some other exceptions there as well. Even if uh, an officer ex executes a search warrant and there's a problem with the search warrant, it's later held to be invalid. As long as the officer uh, didn't know or couldn't know or didn't contribute to causing that search warrant to be invalid, uh, then the courts have said, look, this doesn't deter the police officer, right? That's the whole point of the exclusionary rule is to deter the police officer from engaging in unreasonable searches in violation of the Fourth Amendment. But when they execute a search warrant that they really had no reason to know, had some technical defect or some other problem, there's no point in excluding the evidence because it doesn't deter the police officer. So this is called the good faith exception. It comes out of a case called the United States versus Leon, L-E-O-N. You can read about that. Another exception which comes up from time to time, officers are oftentimes required to knock and announce their presence when they serve a search warrant at somebody's home, oftentimes at night, sometimes they mess that up. Say they violated the knock and announce rule. They just entered, maybe they just smashed the door down without knocking and announcing and at least giving a few seconds for somebody to answer the door. It's been held by the courts that a violation of the knock and announce rule is not going to trigger exclusion of evidence under the exclusionary rule. And then finally, the attenuation doctrine. Sometimes uh, courts will find that it's true that evidence uh, was seized illegally, but the fruit of that, there might have led to some other evidence, which led to some other evidence, and they'll say at some point, this is too attenuated from the original bad acting, the original unreasonableness of the police officer. It's too attenuated. There's a chain of causation, and that chain has gone on too long. Therefore, there's no point in excluding the evidence. So it can be very hard to get evidence excluded. We have successfully gotten evidence excluded in the past. You have to be very creative to bring these arguments. Oftentimes, these are good ways to defend against a case. You can make a creative argument to say, hey, this was an unreasonable search or seizure in violation of the fourth or fifth or sixth amendment in some way, and the evidence should be excluded. And sometimes, if the evidence is excluded, the whole case will go away. So sometimes a prosecutor might look at the threat of simply suppressing evidence and give a better deal. Oftentimes at our law firm, we will raise the issue with the prosecutor to get a better plea. Sometimes we will draft a motion to suppress and not file it and send it to the prosecutor and say, hey, do you really want us to file this and we can hash it out? Sometimes that'll get us a better plea. Sometimes we file the motion to suppress and then we hold it in abeyance, which means, hey, it's filed, but the prosecutor doesn't have to respond yet. We'll sort of hang this over the prosecutor's head while we're negotiating the case. That way, if we don't strike a deal, prosecutor will have to go through the time and aggravation of responding to our suppression motion. And then sometimes we'll actually file it, argue it, get a hearing, and there are times where before the judge rules, the prosecutor might think, boy, if that judge suppresses the evidence, my case is gone. They may offer a good plea at that point. And other times you have to go all the way through and file it and get the judge's ruling. And we have had occasions where judges suppress evidence and the case goes away. You just don't know. It's all about uh, properly uh, representing people and you got to do it aggressively and you got to be able to research and file good motions and argue persuasively in these cases. Now. There is criticism for the exclusionary rule. There's actually lots of criticism, and the criticism has been out there for quite a long time, and frankly, I tend to agree with some of the criticism. The idea here is that why should somebody who actually committed a crime and did the wrong thing, why should they benefit just because uh, a police officer maybe made a bad judgment out at the scene about whether or not there was reasonable suspicion or probable cause. These can be squishy kinds of concepts. There are nine people on the United States Supreme Court. It's not uncommon uh, that five of the justices will be on one side and four are on the other side on a question about whether or not something was uh, with reasonable suspicion or with probable cause. 
courts have not been very clear on what exactly these definitions mean. So the argument is, hey, just because the officer may be acting in good faith, guessed the wrong way, why should this create a windfall to the person who was actually charged with the crime? You could imagine a very serious case, right? What if the officer unreasonably opens the trunk of a vehicle and inside is a dead body and all kinds of other horrible evidence? And the defense attorney argues, hey, this was a bad search. And if it is a bad search, then all that evidence is gone. And somebody who might have committed a first degree murder actually would go free. And so the argument goes, why should the windfall uh, go to the uh, defendant? And you know, we're letting a murderer go free here because of a rule that is not required by the US Constitution. OK, there are some uh, good arguments here to deal with both things. I personally favor a tort remedy. That's right. Lots of commentators have argued over the years, and I tend to agree with them, that what you could do here is do away with the exclusionary rule, allow the evidence in, even if it was unreasonably or unconstitutionally obtained, but allow a tort remedy, which means that uh, the person who has suffered the violation now gets to sue in a civil case. I know what you're thinking. There are things that can be done to keep out from that jury as irrelevant the actual crime that was committed or what happened there. You could also have statutory damages. In other words, the damage for searching somebody's trunk and illegally finding evidence could be X amount, and those are the amount of damages that get awarded in such a case. Keep in mind, there really isn't a remedy. The other side of this question is, if the officers search your trunk unreasonably, unconstitutionally, and nothing is found, well, then there's nothing to suppress. And oftentimes, a case like this will go without redress, without a remedy, because there are no damages. The damages might be, OK, you were delayed a few extra minutes. It's not really worth bringing the case. And these cases now are not punished. So the only person who actually gets a benefit from the exclusionary rule is the person who's actually guilty when there's evidence found. If we change this into a tort remedy, then everybody would be able to get damages for violations of their constitutional rights, even when there was no evidence to suppress in a criminal case. Anyways, those are just some ideas to chew on, to think about how we could improve our criminal justice system. Hopefully this video has been helpful to explain a little bit about the exclusionary rule, what it is, how it works, where it comes from, and a few things to think about how we could maybe improve the criminal justice system. So again, my name is Mark J. Victor. I am the founder of the Attorneys for Freedom law firm. I urge you to check out Attorneys for Freedom. We represent people nationally. We're licensed in both Arizona and Hawaii. We often represent people in state and federal courts through the Pro Hoc Vice rules. You should check that out. If you want to be a client of our firm and have us on retainer, so if you do have a problem, a criminal problem, certain types of civil problems at dramatically discounted rates, check out the Attorneys on Retainer program by going to the Attorneys for Freedom website. Click on the red button that says attorneys on retainer you'll see tons of information there and uh, because we're activists at our law firm we want to change the world we want to improve the world we are pro-freedom I'd be remiss if I didn't mention to you that our law firm is the firm that founded the entire global peace movement called the live and let live movement you should check out that at live and let live Org. If you like what you see there, I urge you to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Sign up there, become a member of the Live and Let Live movement, and let's change the world together. Happy to hear your comments, criticisms. If you bring it civil, you definitely will get a response from me. I can always be reached at Mark, M-A-R-C, at attorneysforfreedom.com. Thanks for listening.